Okay, we might kick things off. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Neil Walsh from Civica, and I head up um, our housing business across Australia and New Zealand. And on behalf of the National Housing Conference, Ahuri and Civica, um, welcome to this afternoon's Think Tank. Uh, and the topic we're going to be talking about is transforming through technology. But before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, uh, the Wurundjeri people, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So with that, I would like to now invite Alex to the stage from Boom Power. And Alex is going to talk to us about tackling energy through digital innovation. Um, the other thing is there will be questions after each one, and I've got some power banks here, so I want some really good questions, yeah? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the, of the land we, on which I talk, Wurundjeri people, and um, acknowledge their, um, their ancestors, uh, pre past, present, and emerging. That is the first time I've been brave enough to say that as an Englishman, and, um, but now I've got it out there. Um, so, thanks for coming. Uh, what am I going to cover today? So, um, I'm going to cover a problem that we came across first as a consulting business uh, 12, 13 years ago, which was that uh, community housing providers and social housing providers wanted to reduce their emissions and they wanted to reduce energy costs for their tenants. And the problem was that consulting and energy auditing every single property or even making huge assumptions about thousands of properties was expensive, time consuming, and pretty unrealistic. Oh, some of you would have heard the phrase, software is eating the world. To an extent, it is true. Um, we, um, so SPM, my, uh, my co-presenter, even though he's not here on the stage, he is right in front of me, if you have any questions about SPM, uh, Steve Lyons. Um, they provide detailed asset management um, and software and um, asset lifecycle models. Boom automates energy audits, business cases, decision making, procurement, and monitoring. Together, we save around 70% of the time required for energy retrofit projects, 20% on capital costs, and make the dynamic world of distributed energy available to the social housing sector at the touch of a button. Just checking. So what I'm going to talk about today is a, is a case study for Housing Choices Australia. And I'm going to talk about a story that started back in 2018 uh, when I first met the team there at Housing Choices, James Henry and a guy called Ravi, who uh, takes a lot of responsibility as assets coordinator for, um, for the assets generally. But somehow I got landed with this, uh, this headache, also known as energy. So 2018, this first flood of money came in. They, um, the big, a thing called the Victorian Property Fund, which uh, is actually funded by the Estate Agents Council. They uh, came out for the first time to fund sustainable energy upgrades rather than new build housing. They needed, so all the CHOs needed to present business cases, and they gave them two months to do it. Now, I know the VPF isn't here, the Victorian government might be, that's a very, very short amount of time to assess buildings and come up with business cases and present those to government to get funding. So, two months, what do you do? They had, they had assessment reports of some of their buildings, but those assessment reports were, you know, had blanket recommendations. They said, oh, you should think about installing solar on some of your, some of your properties. You should think about putting in air conditioning, replacing gas heating. They didn't have any detailed recommendations. The time is of the essence. So actually, at that point, solar was selected as the easiest product that they knew would give a good payback to tenants. At the back end of those projects in 2018, Housing Choices, Ravi in particular, uh, was landed with solar homes. So some of you would have heard of that. Um, Victorian government, for uh, good, or, good or worse, came up with a fund to, um, to fund solar on the residential market, homeowners, but also at the end of their announcement said in a, in a, in a uh, one, one sentence at the bottom, this will also be available for community housing providers. 
So we were able, along with Chia Vic, Pig Body in Victoria, to um, negotiate for the Victorian Property Fund money, those projects, to also be eligible for solar homes so that they could um, then spend that money on additional projects. It was great. The Boom platform was in its infancy, provided expert inputs on sizing, on the buildings to focus on, decision making, and aggregate, aggregated procurement for seven organizations. Ravi was able to spend $500,000 on 80 units, doing 400 kilowatts of solar. Opportunity 2 came along in 2020. At this point, Ravi had gone from someone I used to talk to that had no idea what he was talking about around energy, really good at properties, um, to getting to 2020 and suddenly he knows what he's talking about. He, uh, you know, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd been able to train him up on a software, he'd run projects, he could log in and understand where he should be installing whatever energy products he wanted. So between the VPF projects and the solar homes, hundreds of families have reduced their bills through solar. Now, Ravi also had an air conditioning program to run. He was worried about increasing costs for energy, um, increasing costs to tenants by installing air conditioning. So, they used Boom as a platform, software, to, um, to assess their buildings, assess the, a few hundred, and generate business cases for the solar and air conditioning so they could combine the two and work out where they should be investing their money. Again, solar homes was driving lots of investment in solar. You take the money where you can get it, particularly in the social housing sector. The housing choices, they drove, they also drove really innovative projects where they were sharing solar. Uh, so one of those was Alum. There's a guy from Alum uh, sitting with us today. So Alum allows you to share solar um, across apartment buildings. And so as a one of those products, we're able to we're able to analyze and assess. Um, using a sole share device as opposed to installing, say, 50 individual solar systems. So he was able, Ravi was able to compare which products, um, whether it is solar or whether it is shared solar or whether it is just upgrading a centralised hot water system and, uh, and make decisions. In 2021, he carried on. Housing choices, some of you will know, some of you won't. There are about 6,500 6 buildings, second only to CHL, um, and they um, are growing constantly. They have a net zero, uh, sorry, 20, 2021, decided they were going to try and get their property portfolio to net zero emissions. Now, how do you do that um, without, uh, without not being able to build more houses? You know, we all know the, the core business of a community housing provider is to build more affordable housing. If they're spending money on energy, um, yeah, that's, that's going to detract from their, from their mission. Globally, there's about $100 billion per annum now being invested in distributed energy. We expect in the next 20 years, about $30 trillion to go into distributed energy. It's driven by rooftop solar, but it also means uh, a whole range of different business models and services around hot water, around air conditioning, around batteries, around electric vehicles, you name it. So really, it's a very dynamic, and it is, it's an incredibly dynamic, complex market where, um, where tenants and householders should be at the centre. So for a community housing provider, how do you obtain best value for money? How do you compare and select those products? I heard Charles from uh, Blue Chip in the last session talking about whether they should be installing electric vehicle charges in their new builds. Um, they're putting on solar. To be honest, that's probably a bit of a no-brainer. But the EV charging, should you be doing it now? Should you do it in five years' time? Should you do it in 20 years' time, as Charles suggested? And how should you pay for it? What business model should you use? And um, how should you go about it? How do you know you're going to get quality products? How can you ma maximise the benefits for residents, which is the main goal here? And how do you avoid losing long-term opportunities by locking in a technology today or locking in a business model today and say signing up for a 20-year contract um, and not being able to get out of that and get the best value for your tenants. Retrofit measures contribute a huge amount 
to housing choices, net zero, and ESG goals. Okay, their existing stock is what they need to focus on. And even with the wider residential market, we know around 2% of, uh, of new build every year, uh, is around 2% equivalent of the existing stock is built every year. So actually, even, even then, existing buildings are where we have the real problem. So as I said at the beginning, energy auditing every property was impractical and expensive. So how about integrating your asset management, property condition inspections with energy assessments? You already do property inspections. For a CHO, now you've got a cyclical basis, you have to do, do those in any case, just to, keep, um, just to keep on top of your assets, but also in many cases for, for regulatory reasons. By integrating property inspections, getting the data you need within SPM, for example, and that being able to come across to Boom via an API, that means you're cutting the project time required by over 70%. And we know that because we did it as consultants for five years with the community housing sector. So for us, the time as consultants or project managers was cut by over 70%. Capital costs, they're using it for competitive procurement. It can procure solar, storage, lighting, hot water, heating and cooling, insulation, draft proofing through the Boom platform. And it's all sized because the tenderers are basing their prices on the images you have within the, pro within the software. They're basing it on the system sizes that have already been generated through the platform. And they don't have to do site inspections. They don't have to do a sales process. Uh, we've found we've had about $5 million worth of projects go through in 2021. And they're all about 20% below any benchmarked um, published prices. So you take a portfolio approach and you take it and you over over the course of say three years for housing choices or for CHL for example they take three years um, they will have uh, audited energy audited all of their properties at the same time as doing the property condition inspections. Then here's the options and artists to say where, which what should we be investing in and which properties run the competitive procurement monitor all of the data coming from, say, solar inverters, meters, um, from um, existing, could even be existing spreadsheets. Um, you know, spreadsheets are 42 years old. They're a great tool, but maybe not the one to be, um, to be using to be making decisions about a $30 trillion industry. So one set of data is captured for two purposes. One, first time, the SPM, Assets Life, life Cycle Models. Now, Steve can talk far better about those than I can, but essentially making decisions about, um, oh, I'm happy for you too if you want, Steve, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on with the flow. Um, but uh, yeah, essentially making decisions over you know, 10, 20 years about when is the right time to be replacing assets. It's my understanding. Again, we can have Q&A at the end. Um, and the boom is the energy assessments, the decision-making tools, and procurement and management. So there are two purposes to collecting that PAS data, as is known in New South Wales, or property condition inspection data. So the resolution for housing choices, and Ravi in particular, who uh, has managed to, uh, to continue in a, um, uh, without being totally overloaded, um, Housing Choices Australia have a resolution to reach net zero emissions for their offices by 2025 and their housing stock by 2040. So that's their target. They're monitoring, verifying, and managing the data. All of that, all of the, what I've just talked about, is going to inform their steps to getting to that goal. They're accelerating the uptake of innovative products, procuring things like the sole share device, but also different services and solutions via a trusted marketplace. Oh, two screens by the trusted marketplace. So, um, because although Boom services enterprises like community housing providers, we also provide service product companies. So if they have a new IoT, let's say an IoT product, Internet of Things product, basically lots of hardware things, um, they also use Boom to model the business cases for their own products. So that, that is made available to consultants or to energy brokers or to community housing providers. 
So as the, as the energy market changes and new products and services come on board, you're always kept across it to say, well, you know, what should we be doing next? When should we invest in these products? And when should we, we be replacing things? So what does the future look like? We think. Um, the next thing, NATO's in-home assessments are meant to be coming by the end of the year. Uh, so that's for existing buildings, probably be a voluntary thing to start with. Um, and um, so we're working with a company called Hero that does NATO's ratings for uh, new build. They're awesome, by the way, do whole of building um, assessments. Um, and they're the first non-government affiliated software company that does NATO's ratings. They do it for new build at the moment. So imagine if your property condition inspections also allowed you to do NATO's ratings voluntarily in the first case, but actually probably mandatory at some point in the future. Something like shared solar, batteries, um, analyzing um, from different metering solutions, different inverters. Uh, you may already have solar installed, in which case, in most cases, you can aggregate the data and be analyzing that at a portfolio level to make decisions or to negotiate with new business models, um, say, with, with retailers, energy retailers. Should I do both? There's a nice quote from Dwayne, who uh, uh, is just recently was, was, I know Dwayne was part of uh, Access Housing. He was the asset manager over in WA. And with the merger with Housing Choices, he is now national um, general manager, national assets. And um, that was his quote. But so between SPM and Boom, the marketplace that, make, that is made available through that combination also supports uh, existing consultants that you may be working with, um, brokers, product vendors, um, so you can stay across that latest innovation. And um, and I'm really excited, to be honest, as you can probably say, I, see, I'm a very enthusiastic person. I've, uh, I've had 15 years in, uh, in community housing, either um, working directly on it or through energy and sustainability. And, um, and for me, I'm looking for enthusiastic people and organisations that are equally ambitious that we can support to actually deliver this. Um, yes, zero emissions are great, um, but more importantly, reducing, reducing bills for tenants and maximising the opportunities that are going to be available for the next 20 years. The quicker you do it, the better. So if you have emissions, if you have energy cost goals, or you simply want to access that world, um, feel free to drop me a line, um, or Steve, and, uh, and Steve can talk about the, uh, the SPM side later on. But look forward to questions. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. And um, I guess it's a great example of how open technologies and partnerships uh, are working together to reduce or create sustainability and efficiencies across um, today's CHP's housing portfolio. Um, so we are going to open up for questions now, if anybody has any questions for Alex. Let me see if there's any online. No, not online. Oh, there we go. So, um, so this, so does it take into account the asset management of the solar and the? Um, yes. So both both elements. So uh, the API between SPM and Boom would be two way, in that um, we um, in that. From Boom's perspective, uh, that monitoring piece, so you're monitoring, say, you know, 100 or 1,000 solar inverters, plus um, you might be having data coming from um, air conditioners, uh, that informs um, if something stops working. Or, um, or you know, the business cases are based on your know, simple paybacks. Solar systems you know, are going to last you a minimum of 20 years anyway um, and need very little maintenance. Um, so the, uh, it's... it's Whereas something like hot water systems, you know, heating and cooling, uh, you can see from an energy perspective in Boom when something isn't working. You might see a spike in electricity if you're moving to electrification of buildings, for example. Um, Steve, you haven't got a microphone, but you can talk. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so,
Okay, do we have any more questions for Alex? Okay, big round of applause for Alex, please. Okay, I'd like to uh, invite Lance from uh, New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice up to the stage, if we could. And Lance is going to be talking to us about uh, the DCJ Housing Connect program, transforming online services, four years in, four million transactions annually and 96% satisfaction. Thanks, Lance. Thanks. Am I on? All good? Can you hear me? Uh, can I start by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land today and I pay my respects to Elders past, present, emerging, and particularly to any Aboriginal colleagues that are in the room or online with us today. Let me just get my slides. Uh, so it's a real pleasure uh, for me to be here today to tell you the story of our Housing Connect program. Uh, it's a story that I first brought to the National Housing Conference back in 2013 in Adelaide, um, where we revealed our grand plans for digitising the, the housing system in New South Wales and um, revolutionising that system. It's a story I was then able to update everybody on at the 2017 Sydney uh, conference as well, uh, and now I get to reveal the finished product. Although finished is probably not the right word because it never will be truly finished. Um, digital is the way of the future, and so we must keep building, we must keep expanding, we must keep investing, and we must keep uh, enhancing. So would public housing customers choose and adopt digital as their channel preference? And would the government not close down offices and reduce staff if we actually achieved that? There were so many people back at the time of Adelaide and since then that told me that we wouldn't succeed that we were too ambitious and that we couldn't do this without disadvantaging clients and without losing staff. But today, in the brief time that we have, I want to tell you how, the, how we did make it happen and how, as Neil said, we took digital from 1,000 transactions through to over 4 million transactions forecast for this financial year in New South Wales. But I also don't want to tell you how to suck eggs because many of you have started your digital uh, transformation journeys already and I've taken lots of learnings from many of you uh, into our program and Alice is going to be talking about the South Australia experience this afternoon. But today I just want to tell you about our story and if it can help any of you in your journey uh, to think about your own services and where you can take digital, then that's a good thing. And of course, all of us in New South Wales are always happy to share. So where did we start? Likely the same place that your organisation started your digital journey at, and that is that we were massively reliant on huge volumes of paper, paper forms, paper signatures, checklists that we fill in by hand, everything data entered, entered by hand, duplicative manual processes galore. Our housing application alone was 45 pages long with questions repeated over and over again. It had to be given to us by hand. Margaret's nodding, she knows very well what we were like. It had to be given to us by hand and then we had staff data enter it by hand, copious amounts of staff. We gave our housing clients limited choice. If you wanted to contact or interact with us, come into a local office during business hours or we'll post you a paper form, or you can do a few basic services over the phone. But meanwhile, the world had passed us on. Centrelink was digital, Medicare was digital, I could get a complete home loan online, I could book an entire round the world holiday all online, but in housing, let me send you a paper form. 85% of our clients had a mobile phone. And our surveys of clients were telling us that they wanted greater choice, greater convenience, and that they were frustrated that we were so far behind. And with an ever-increasing customer base, sorry, ever-increasing complex customer base, and no injection of new resource, we had to get smarter about how we did our business. 
So whilst 2013 marked the commencement of the Housing Connect program, our journey actually started years earlier, implementing small-scale digital solutions, testing the take-up, testing our implementation, testing the results and testing the benefits. And so we started in 2009 by introducing fax machines. Can you believe it? Allowing clients to apply for rental bond products through a self-service facility, but they were so successful, we, we, we built about 70 of them in a couple of years. Embarrassingly, it wasn't until 2009 that we introduced ePay as an online rent account payment option for our clients. The very first tenant to pay his rent via ePay was a 75-year-old from Kuma, and his name was Bill, and I know that because I rang him that day to congratulate him that he was the first, and he was so excited, as was I. In 2012, we launched what we intended to be a really quick and dirty online repair lodgement system, and that quick and dirty is still running today as our e-repair tool. And we also launched our digital queue management systems in our offices to improve service and traffic flow. The gap between 2012 and 2016 allowed us to design the full Housing Connect uh, strategy, source the funding through multiple business cases, which yes, take a long time, and start our procurement processes. This led to the first major digital solution delivered through Housing Connect in 2016, being our desktop My Housing account and information portal, allowing tenants and applicants to access and update their own information themselves in their own time at a time that was convenient. This was followed closely by a first set of digital forms integrated with our back-end system to eliminate all that data entry, and dynamic and smart so that the forms only ask you the questions relevant to the answers that you've already given. In 2017, we finally gave customers the option to receive their mail from us electronically via email or SMS with a link. And then in 2018, it was a massive year for us. We launched our front office innovation program, chucking out those awful fax machines that used to screw up all the time, paper, etc., and replacing them with brand new self-service computers, Wi-Fi, video screens, concierge tablet devices. And then it was time for Ivy, and Ivy really is the shining star of Housing Connect. Ivy, or iVisitU, is a custom designed and built iOS app for our tenancy field staff to use when conducting their tenancy inspections, their property inspections. Ivy has really been an absolute game changer for us. In 2019, we launched the My Housing app for customers on both iOS and on Android. Two different technologies, two different builds, two different costs. And we've continued to build on our online forms, but when you've got over 60 customer-facing forms, it's, still, it's going to take us a while to get there, but we're nearly there. But we've also been commissioned by other parts of the department to deliver their forms as well using our online form solution, which is um, really fantastic. In 2020, we delivered the first big extension to the Ivy app, introducing fully digital and mobile tenancy leasing using digital signatures. And I'll show you that in just a second. And we're currently building our fourth mobile app which is called Journey on Home, and it's another custom design solution, this time to support our assertive outreach staff who undertake patrols out in the community, on the streets, in the bush, on trains, as they find and support people sleeping rough. And we're also about to implement our next major extension to the Ivy Mobile app, which is called Set for Success, which will deliver more information into the app for staff to use when they're in the field, better data capturing, particularly around property care and, and, and the asset, and a new service where we will automatically send educational and informational messages to tenants in the first six months of their tenancy so that they can learn how to be a tenant if they don't know already. Um, you know, simple things like, you know, the bins, the colours of the bins, how do you look after mould, all that stuff that we just take for granted that we think people know when they sign a lease. So now I'm going to give you a quick look at what some of these solutions look like. This is our ePay service, which is, our, which is now the number one choice of channel for tenants to pay their rent arrears or property damage costs or bond loan repayments. RDS, of course, is still the preferred rent payment channel. 
This is eRepair, a diagrammatic tool that you can click on the images to choose what the issue is uh, with a request sent directly to the maintenance contractors. And we now get over 100,000 orders through eRepair every year. This is our account and information portal. We've got over 100,000 registered tenants and applicants that are using this online tool to access and update their accounts and a range of other services. And this is an example of our application for housing assistance online form, which is open to all social housing uh, applicants across New South Wales to apply for both public and community housing. This, along with our, uh, our other forms that we've uh, digitised to date, have been designed alongside clients who helped us get the flow and the layout and the language and the colours as close to right for the people that are actually going to use them. And we consistently run a greater than 95% satisfaction rating with ease of use of using this form. Online forms now account for over 70% of all the forms that we receive for housing. And this is Ivy, or the, or the dashboard of Ivy, I should say. There's lots of other screens in the app. But this is the Ivy app. And Ivy is accessed via an iPad, uh, and we've delivered those to over 700 tenancy staff uh, that work out in the field. And staff have written to us that the launch of Ivy is probably the most impactful IT change that they have ever experienced in their, in their working life in housing. And they tell us that it's saved over 50% in admin time, and that is probably conservative. It was the first time that we ever delivered something designed by them, custom made for them. And you can see this in the results as well, because the number of client service visits we do, or tenancy inspections, whatever you want to call them, the year before Ivy rolled out, we were only visiting 34% of the portfolio once a year, or roughly around 34,000 properties. Just prior to COVID, which changed everything, the result was nearly 80%, and we have a target, once we were able to get back to do face-to-face, -face of 99% in the next 12 months, with no additional resource. This is a snapshot uh, of our front of house in the Liverpool office. Uh, where we've launched our front office technology and innovation. We've launched uh, self-service into 25 offices now, and we've got a plan and some funding uh, to do another 20 more over the next uh, 18 months, which is really exciting. They'll all, pretty much every office will be done. And this is digital leases, so digital leases on the Ivy app, and this screenshot shows the electronic lease documents with DocuSign embedded, the electronic signature uh, envelope of DocuSign embedded. All of the lease establishment forms and lease documents are stored electronically and delivered to the client via email or printed on request, which I have to say is very few and far between. No more paper forms, no more paper leases. We've established over 20,000 new public housing leases through this process over the last 18 months. And we take the opportunity at the time of signing up the tenant uh, to the new lease to also sign them up for the My Housing app. And this is the My Housing app, which you can download at any time, free to download, of course. It has a range of both non-registered and registered services, services that you can easily access without an account, like ePay and eRepair and Ask Easy, and those that you do need to sign in for. So if you're checking your accounts, if you're a client, you're checking your accounts or filling in pre-populated forms or checking the status of your housing application or updating your details, we have a registration process for that. We've built two apps, as I said before, one iOS, one iOS and one Android. And it was lucky that we did, because ever since we launched these apps, it has been line ball 50-50% as to the users of both, of both systems. Um, and we've had over 80,000 downloads since we, since we launched. Journey on home. So as I mentioned, we're uh, in the throngs of building our last, uh, sorry, not our last, our fourth app. Um, and this app is called Journey on Home. It'll be launched in pilot in April and will support those assertive outreach staff that do that uh, difficult and, and complex work of supporting people sleeping rough out in the community. And for them, instead of what they do now, which is carrying a clipboard with forms and notepads, recording engagements in writing, they won't have to do that anymore. Everything will be recorded on the Journey on Home app. They'll be able to refresh that client information and update it if they re-engage with people out on the street, track and monitor patrols and homelessness hotspots uh, as well. 
So all of this tech is really great, and I'm very proud of it, obviously, but our public, is the public and the clients actually using it? In the eight years since we started Housing Connect, we've taken those digital transactions from 1,000 to that forecast of over 4 million this year. But we know that digital isn't for everybody, so we haven't closed offices, we haven't reduced operating hours, and our contact centre is still open 24-7, just to cater for those people where digital is not the preferred option for whatever reason. What we have done, though, is give our customers choice, convenience, empowerment, and we've given our staff a massive amount of time back in their day to focus on the important work that they do. So I could spend hours telling you about what we did well and what we could have done differently, but these, I think, are the most important elements of our success to date. Co-design, it's a real buzzword, everyone likes to throw it around, but how do you actually make co-design work in the real world? We engaged real tenants, real applicants, ex-users of the homelessness system to come and help us design those My Housing services that you've seen today, from the colours and the layout and the language of the words, they helped us design everything that, was, uh, that you see on those screens. And this took an enormous amount of work. The logistics to manage that is very challenging, but it was absolutely worth it. Employ the right, or employ the right people, well, that um, always helps. But the model for us in Housing Connect from the very beginning came from the bottom up. All of my program team, including myself, at some, some stage in our career have walked the talk. We've all done the roles for which we were designing the solutions for, and no offence to amazing and clever IT colleagues, some of which might be in the room, but we weren't from IT, we were from the business, we've been client service officers ourselves, and we know the work, we know the clients, and we know what works and what doesn't work. And that sense of ownership and pride in delivering real change can't be underestimated when the change is being delivered by the people who are passionate about the business. Testing, we test, we retest, we pilot, we repilot over and over again before we release anything to staff and customers. And lastly, we started small and grew, building on success, proving the benefit, proving the return on investment, not over-promising, delivering really good quality and expanding and then enhancing. And this is what makes it all worthwhile. We get heaps of great feedback, but I really especially love hearing from those clients who are often categorised as the so-called non-adopters of technology. Like the 73-year-old who sent us a note about how easy it was for her to use an online form from home, from home. or 75-year-old Kuma Bill who paid his rent online, or well, the tenant with a hearing impairment who wrote to us after we launched e-repair to say for the first time ever, he lodged his own repair request himself and he thanked us for going digital and I still get goosebumps over it. I've had this note from him up in my office ever since as a reminder about why we do what we do. And then there is this photo. This is a real DCJ tenancy officer with a tenant on her porch of a Mount Drew at home on the first day that we launched, Ivy, on, uh, launched the Ivy app. So technology for me is not a barrier. It's an enabler in so many ways. And we have an obligation not to leave our housing clients behind. Thanks. Lance, and um, thanks for sharing the story of DCJ's digital transformation journey um, through the Housing Connect program. So I think that's a really topical thing at the moment with many CHPs out there uh, looking to embark on something similar right now. So lots of great lessons learned from there. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions for Lance. Remember, I've got some power boards here. Um, so let's get some good questions.
Uh, yeah, so the question is, what do we do with paper that we receive in addition maybe to digital or instead of digital? Uh, we use a trim system. That's our records management system. So, um, yes, we would receive sometimes online applications or online forms that then need to be followed up with paper for whatever reason. Um, and uh, they could be handed over the counter or mailed in. We'll trim them, we'll attach them to the record and we'll go from there. But the other thing that we've done with the My House, the My Housing app has a feature where if you're an applicant and we're assessing your application and we need some further documentation, it will send you a message to say, this is the information that's missing that we need from you and here you go, you can upload it straight away, take a photo, use the native features of your phone or iPad to take the photo and then it loads straight into our system. Yeah, it's a great question. So that question was around digital inclusion and how that sits alongside this program, particularly with, you know, obviously with the cohort that we deal with that can't, may not often be able to afford it, uh, connections at home. So I might answer that a couple of different ways. So firstly, I might just mention that when we designed the Ivy Mobile app, I know this is slightly separate to your question, but it links. Um, when we designed the Ivy Mobile app for the staff, we did enough research around the state to know that we had to design an offline capability. So, off, so Ivy is completely workable offline, as it is online. And you may automatically think of remote locations in Burke or Broken Hill, but we have just the same issues in Kylie's patch, which is in the inner city, uh, in our high-rise buildings. We will sometimes lose network. So we made sure that we built that solution so it could work off, off network. Now, more to your question, which is about digital inclusion. Um, we did do a piece of work uh, a few years ago with Info Exchange, uh, where we uh, worked with them to tailor a whole heap of resources for public housing tenants for simple things like how do you get access to email, what is an email and how do you register for it and all those really simple things. Uh, and then we partnered with them to do roadshows right across the state, um, delivering that information uh, to staff uh, and to service providers. So we did that. I would love to do a lot more of that. The challenge is that often when I get money, when I bog, beg, beg, borrow and steal, I get money to do particular projects or technology, but I can't get enough money to do a lot of work around that. So I talk to a lot of service providers, I talk to CHPs about that, um, but from our side we, we do little pockets of things. So again, pointing Kylie out, Kylie's got a community centre in Waterloo where there's computers. We've got different situations like that around the state but from a central office program perspective, not as much as I would like and as much as I think we need. Perfect. We've just got a question over here, then we'll bounce back over to that side. Uh, so the question was uh, in terms of our electronic lodgement process, e-repair, uh, how does that sit with maintenance contractors? Yep. Um, and I'm sorry if the people online heard me sigh because there was a sigh. Um, look, I, it's been a challenge. So the e-repair system will just take the request and send it straight through the maintenance contractor. They pick it up and they process it from there in their systems. We have the technology. In fact, when we did the, the user experience design workshops to do a lot more in the My Housing app to support tenants with information about what's happening with maintenance requests and with their property. So like a repair tracker, like an inspection tracker, we've got all that ready. We can't deliver it at the moment because we're constrained by maintenance contractors, contracts. Uh, and of course, in New South Wales, the asset is owned and, and managed by the Land and Housing Corporation. We are the service provider uh, on behalf of the Land and Housing Corporation. So our ability to influence maintenance contracts is a challenge. Um, but given about six months ago, I had to present to a parliamentary inquiry on maintenance. And one of the things I took the opportunity to do was to say, we can do all this stuff but we need change at the maintenance contract level, so hopefully that will, will start to happen. We can, the technology's there, 
Not too difficult. And we know clients want it. It's one of the number one things they have asked us for to get better information around you know, maintenance and repairs. Okay, we have a couple of questions down here. Yep. Good question. Uh, so the question was around, can people from non-English speaking backgrounds use our online services? Um, they, our, our online forms and the apps at the moment are not translated, so they're not multilingual. Um, one of the issues that we have with that is you have to be able to have a back-end system where the data is stored to be able to cape, cape, cope and cater for all those different languages, and we aren't quite there just yet. Um, of course, if you have the whiz-bang things on Google and whatever, you can do, you can translate, you know, pages on websites, um, but we haven't got our services and systems at the moment ready to translate. But one thing that we did do during COVID that we've never done before is we've implemented digital communications in multi-languages. So all of our, we've been doing, as I'm sure many of you have, campaign after campaign around vaccinations and clinics and getting tested and all this stuff. We now deliver those messages in multi-languages specifically to the tenant based on the language that we have recorded in our system. So, gentlemen, just here. Yeah, can you touch on that, um, a little bit with the set for success part of listing ads gives you, but how do you sort of approach both the potential and the pitfalls around suggested content like within these digital platforms? You know, how do you uh, kind of link people to additional information without doing too much suggested content? Oh, so that question was around how do we, uh, so it was a few things, how do we link to uh, content and how do we decide what content to link to and how, how would we deal with sort of community-based stuff. All the research and, and stuff, all the research and user experience testing and all the ideas that we have, one of the things I would love to do is be able to make the My Housing app more local and more community-based and be able to deliver community messages and tap into our districts where they're doing events. So that's something that we can do, in, in, it's in the pipeline. Um, from the My Housing app at the moment, really our, our link is out to Ask Easy as an external agency, and that just made sense for us to do. It's a service directory for the whole country. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, and Info Exchange, we're happy for us to do that. Um, but that's really the only link that we have uh, externally that I can think of at the top of my head at the moment. In terms of how we decide, we, with every service that I've shown you today, we did an enormous amount of research user testing, we did spend a bit of money on this to, to do all that design, discovery and design uh, you know, stuff to make sure that what we were putting into the first versions or the second versions was the priority order based on what clients and staff were telling us and what we were able to do. Perfect. We've got one more question. Uh, so that question was around how do we manage digital storage, particularly relevant to uh, large file sizes like photos. Um, so you might have heard me say in that presentation that I come from the business, so I'm not going to give you a technical answer because I can't. I have wonderful people that are able to do that. Uh, but um, it, it, it was a major question for us. When we first launched Ivy, we limited the photos that you could take when you were doing property inspections to just 70. We've now increased that. I think we've taken it up to 150 or something. I'll have to check. I can't remember, but we've taken it up. Uh, but it was certainly something that we had to think about, obviously. Um, and we use our trim system, as I said before, for the storage of documents. So every single form that gets sent through gets automatically trimmed. So the, the data gets put into our backend system. The form goes into the client's trim file. Uh, when a staff, when a, a tenancy field worker is going out with Ivy and doing a property inspection, they're capturing all the information on Ivy. It automatically produces a report, a client service visit report, 
which goes into the client's trim file, and we've got enough storage there. Through Set for Success, the client will also now get a notification of the outcome of that inspection as well and anything that they need to follow up on, like mowing the lawns or fixing a door. Okay, can we give uh, Lance a big round of applause, please? Great, I'd like to uh, now welcome Alice uh, Lawson from South Australia Housing Authority uh, to the stage. And Alice is going to be talking to us around digital transformation of housing services in the context of COVID. Thank you very much. Last speaker on the day, thanks for hanging in there. Um, I work for a public housing authority as well. And um, it's uh, good scheduling on the part of a hurry, I guess, to have me following Lance, because that's pretty much what I've been doing for the past five years, is taking all of the lessons um, I can out of New South Wales and doing, condensing that long timeline into a very short timeline to focus on digitization of our services as well. So what I'm going to do today is share with you the South Australian experience. And again, um, uh, hopefully there's lessons in there for you, for depending on where you are on your digital journey. I'm going to take um, some of those lessons learned that we had in our big transformation program, and then probably spend more of the time focusing on where we're heading to um, and how we're going to use some of that, uh, those learnings and lessons into the future and the things that are, get me up in the morning and get me excited about that. So a little bit about me. I've, I'm also a housing person. Um, I actually wrote my little notes and I said um, 20 plus years, but then when I was sitting there I was thinking actually it's 30 this year. So 30 years in housing. I um, worked everything from home ownership to national policy in America, in Central America, um, in community housing, um, but spent the last 15 years in public housing. And everything in there from uh, asset management to service delivery, did um, some inclusionary zoning work uh, in that space as well. And really proud and really privileged to be part of that. Um, when I was asked to come across into the IT side, my little IT geek that I am got quite excited about that and said, yep, because, because we believe so much in the services that we provide and know that there is so much more that we can both support our staff, our partners, and our customers. So the big project over the last five years was moving from our old legacy system. So when I'm talking legacy system, a lot of you are young in this office. and There used to be screens that were green with yellow writing. You didn't have a mouse. You used to have function keys. You have to have F2, F3 to get around. Well, as of um, 2020, that is what our staff used. So for 30 years, we had the same legacy system. They went in every day and worked on an old green screen. Um, Lance came over to Adelaide and we got all excited in 2013. Well, it took us another four years to get the business case together um, to get cabinet approval. Um, and so in 2017, we started going through the process of, well, what are we going to buy? How are we going to re-engineer our service? What does it really look like? What does paperless go to? All those sort of things. And we just made lots of trips to New South Wales, quite honestly. Um, and they were extremely generous um, with their time. And, um, and the products are fantastic, as you can see. Um, and then we uh, set out a plan, got a vendor in place, and um, set a, a beautiful project plan. And a few people in the room have been part of it. Very proud. Um, we had to do it all in one lump sum. So we had to do a complete 90% of all of our public housing services um, needed to switch over on the same day. We couldn't break, break apart the old mainframe system. So we had a go live date of uh, April 2020. I can't imagine what happened in April 2020. Um, so all of our perfect planning, we were in dry run three. Um, we had built you know, 100 new interfaces with all of our partners. We used to have paper invoicing for our maintenance. Um, that all went digital um, on the same day. That's 1,000 invoices a day that all needed to be digitized. Um, perfect planning, not perfect insight into what happened with COVID. Um, but anyway, we, we, we had to go ahead. We had to go ahead because this new platform was going to be providing us online services for customers there were, and for our staff to be able to work from home. And we didn't know how long it was going to last, and who knew it was still going to be around um, this long, but we decided to go ahead anyway. Um, and it did mean that we had to change a lot of that stuff that we had learned from New South Wales around partnering with your, with your staff, making sure you're there around your, your, you know, be in each of the offices for the first two months to make sure everybody knows how to use the new system. Well, we couldn't do any of that. We had to move all to virtual. 
Um, and everybody's patient, as I know it happened in all of your offices as well. Everybody had the best of goodwill um, uh, into that, and we used that um, opportunity to work with them and, and transition to the new system. Really exciting. So I'm um, really proud of the team, really proud of the work. It was a $40 million project that spanned over the five years, um, but it does save the Public Housing Authority over $6 million a year. So it pays back itself over those years. So those that are, and we're about a third of the size of, of, of New South Wales, so if you think about in, in, in scale of properties. Um, we also obviously support the private rental sector um, and our homelessness sector as well. So where we are now, so a lot of the things that, that Lance shared with you, we have created an online portal for our customers. They can register online for both public and community housing. They can pay their accounts. They can um, do repair. We actually have the same e-repair, so some of the graphics. Thanks, Lance, for that. Um, we use a similar sort of uh, a module and tool for that. Uh, they can um, ask for a repair online and um, update their details with us uh, and, and manage their accounts. We are still in that process of, of, of promoting it and the take-up. Certainly the private rental, which we did um, move ahead with earlier, we have a 75% take up. So 75% of the people that come to us for private rental assistance use our online services with that. But where to now? You know, like when I look at the opportunities, um, and thank you for your presentation um, around uh, energy efficiency, around AI, around internet of things, around, there's so much opportunity us as you know, housing professionals can see will benefit our customers, benefit our staff, and how do we actually, now that we've got sort of a core system that doesn't look like a green screen anymore, how do we make sure um, that we are tackling the next bit of work that'll help? And what we've decided to focus on is what is going to, what will make the difference for customers? And um, similar to what we had to, to do, so you need to make sure you have a call to action or. A, a driving belief, which is um, we want our housing services to be easy to do business with from our customer's point of view. I mean, it's, you, you, you said it as well, Lance. It's, and we're not at a good space. We're not at a good start, housing providers. Um, there is a customer satisfaction uh, ease to do business survey that happens across all state governments. So out of all of the different public services that are available, housing's right at the bottom around ease to do business with online. And you know, up the top, you've got the ones you might expect. You've got um, uh, the emergency response. You've got uh, the arts. You've got schools. You've got hospitals. In the middle, disability services. And of course, there's massive improvements and investment going there um, around online. But housing, well, we're down the bottom. Um, we're down the bottom with child protection, with prisons, um, and with courts. Uh, I don't know the New South Wales numbers. I'm sure you guys are much more up there, but we've got to do better. You know, your call, you know, your, your, your comments at the end there, we have to do better for our customers. And so we're really looking at what is, how do, how do we tackle that? How do we use that, that challenge um, and that knowing that the technology that we have to improve? So of course we did the, did the things that New South Wales told us to do. You know, so we have lived experience workshops, we have user design ex workshops, talking to our customers going out and understand what is it that, what are their, what's their journey like, mapping their journey, figuring out where those pain points are and trying to identify how do we actually change their experience with the actual housing services that they're, that they're a part of. Um, and of course, we've got surveys, regular surveys out to them. And so as we're moving forward, more regular surveys. As you say, you got the maintenance. Was the maintenance work done well? You know, give us that feedback. Um, and I think it was Helen that said, um, in the larger plenary today around uh, making sure that we're asking questions more regularly um, and making sure that that is driving the changes in our services. So asking the customers and holding yourself accountable to making change of that afterwards. So I'm just gonna talk about two things about why that might look different in the future. And, and I'm sure Lance and I will, will talk at, uh, on ends about all the opportunities we want to to get to, but one is um, private rental, and the second one you actually already ta talked about was around maintenance. And so private rental, we, we I said we offer it online, customers can apply for their private rental assistance from the Public Housing Authority, 75% do it, we give them their assistance. But when we go and sit down with the customer on their journey, what 
what are they actually facing? You know, they're facing a whole bunch more barriers besides that, and we really want to assist them on that. So it starts from the very beginning around their application process. They're going, they're probably filling in 14 different forms for 14 different real estate agents trying to get into properties and still not being successful. So how do we get that one form working? How does that link with not only the housing assistance that we provide, but also then the tribunal or... In our, in our case, the you know, con uh, consumer and business services where the bonds are lodged, when they have a dispute with their landlord. How do we make that assistance more wraparound and looking at it coming from the customer's point of view? The, the second one is around maintenance. Again, we can, uh, our customers can go in and order a repair, but they don't get the, re the, the status updates about it. Our maintenance contractors do the same. They're contacting them to make the appointment, but you know, they may not be there and then they have to reschedule the appointment. Um, and then we're not asking the customers right afterwards about was the, quali was the, was the contractor nice to you? you know, was the work done? Um, uh, was it timely? And was it a good quality? Those uh, basic questions, again, digital services allow us to do that much more efficiently and quicker and real time and allow us to provide that feedback and hold those contractors um, more accountable. So when I look at the lessons, taking that big project, um, uh, that we had to deliver over the five years. You know, one of the core things was there was around governance and making sure that we've got the decision makers on time, make sure we've got the funding um, uh, locked in. But with these ideas, really looking at it from the customer point of view, making sure we expand that broader, looking at all the different partners. So it's not just us as a provider, it's how we work with the homelessness sector, how we work with the community housing sector, um, how we connect up um, and deliver those services for our customers. Um, and then also all believe in that vision of making it easier. The second one, and you've mentioned this as well, Lance, around the user-centered design, code design. Um, we spend a lot of time um, with our own staff when we're focused on our sort of efficiency and in, in, in addressing our media internal systems around, tell me how you do your job. Show me, you know, and just sit there and shadow them as they step, step by step. We need to do the same with our customers and talk to them about what are the things that they're doing and understanding better about how we can assist them and make it more streamlined. Architecture, so I think in another life, I would have been an enterprise architect, the people that like to know how the bits of the computers fit together, because what, what I don't want to do is create a nice looking app or a tool for either our staff or for customers that doesn't link in and, and, and causes a lot of extra work behind the scenes. So having that, you know, a new system, which is great, I want to know how all of those new applications or new tools that I do are going to fit in together so that I can maintain them long term and that I can make sure we can use that data in productive ways. So I don't want the add-ons, I want a good structure, architecture system across, across all of it. And so what that means is sort of doing a lot more. We spent three to five years doing all of our planning for the big um, uh, computer change. We need to spend time to actually understand how that whole bit of the journey fits together so that we can design it right and architect it right. And then the final point, this is also the final point, to sort of reinforce the Land, uh, Lance fan here, um, which is about people. You know, it's about our customers. Um, change management from our own staff's point of view, updating our offices, giving them their tablets, making sure that they believe in the digital um, opportunities that it provides and how it adds to their job, um, how it can help them provide better services, but also with our customers, bringing them along on that journey as well. It's been the most, both the most rewarding and the most hard work um, of the job that we've done. So, that's it. Perfect, thanks Alice, and, uh, and it's great to hear um, your journey that you've gone on, um, and it's great to also see that it's being driven by delivering better outcome for your customers and staff, so it's not just about creating efficiencies, but it's really about delivering better services to your community. Um, so with that, what I'm gonna do is open the floor to any questions for Alice. Remember, I've got I was power banks. Lance took them all for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned that um, your, old, your, your old system had for decades, and then you changed your new system. Uh, did you find you had a lot of staff and or client pushback? And how did you, um, I guess, the workforce manage that, especially when you were transitioning to work from home? Yes, thank you for that. We, um, we called it the mainframe. Um, and we still, to this day, have people that come into workshops that still long for the great old days of the mainframe. 
you know, they've spent 30 years or more of their career with this system. And, and actually, it used to step them through quite easily. So they could click, and then all the processes were sort of like that. And more, more modern systems have windows. <laughs> and you can hop between screens. Um, so yeah, it was a massive change for a number of them. New staff coming in, pick it up really quickly, and we've got great training tools, and people are really um, proud of it. It's, and it was really hard, because um, we had planned a, a softer landing um, before COVID, you know, where we would be alongside them and actually be able to hit them. Um, we're finding that our tail's much longer now. So two years on, we are still doing refresher training. Um, that wasn't how we envisioned it. I don't know if COVID would have offered, you know, a non-COVID world would have offered better opportunity to resolve that. But um, fortunately, we, we still had some buffer in our budget to be able to deliver that. And yeah, it's a real thing. Thanks. Okay, do we have any more questions? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Where did you learn from? No. <laughs> Thanks. So the question is about how do you convince governments um, or people with the purse strings around investing in this next phase? Um, the first phase was easier because the systems were out, out, outdated. They were at risk of crashing, and I couldn't promise them I could put them back up again tomorrow. So if we wanted to collect rent, we wanted to do maintenance, they had to do that. You're right. This next phase, I'm going to be looking to New South Wales really to find out how you get the next pot of money. Um, now, having said that, the, the, there is a whole state agenda around we want to be a state that's easy to do business with. They know that there's a digital agenda here that will help us with that across all of those services. It's why they measure it. It's what we talk about. So, um, and it, the good news is it doesn't cost as much as the big core system replacement. Um, you can do a lot with a smaller bucket of money um, and high impact on that. So fortunately, we've kept a lot of the core team um, that were involved in the original project, and same as you, because they came from that business. So um, we feel like we're already running um, at a really fast pace. So we're going to use every dollar we can most efficiently. No magic there, though. Business case is usual. So the question's about data. We are surveying, um, and how do we use that to, I guess, both um, uh, target where our next area is going to be? And it really is, we're asking the customers around the, their satisfaction with, um, your tenancy managers came out and did a home visit. What was that like? You know, your maintenance, and we know the answer already, quite honestly, it's the maintenance area, but um, they, we are asking them about what is most influencing their view around um, the services that they receive from us. And that is where we're going to invest in. Because that is what is going to turn you know, the, the broader satisfaction right, around our face-to-face our, our -face and our um, over-the-phone services as well. Because if we, can, if we know their pain points, those are the ones we're going to focus on. So yeah, we're asking them. So like Lance, it's not exclusive. They still have the traditional methods. They, we still have our full network of 17 offices across the state. They can come into that. They can use their phone service. But what we do know is we say 90% of our tenants have a mobile phone, 25% of them mobile only, so they don't have computers. But we know private renters, out of all the tenures, they actually have the highest digital inclusion, um, that more so than homeowners. Might be a bit of a factor around age, 
because older people, but still they, they are more digitally inclusive in access to it than, than others. Um, social housing obviously is the lowest digital inclusion, so issues like Wi-Fi and data and those sorts of things we, we need to absolutely address. Um, uh, interestingly, the question around um, uh, people from linguistically different backgrounds, not non-English speaking, um, they have a high, higher rates of digital inclusion because they can use the online translators and all those other things. So we're actually opening up, and, and your great example um, uh, with the customer with the hearing, uh, speech, speech or hearing issue, can't remember. Um, you know, so that provides yet another option for them. But yeah, no, we don't have the, the direction or the intent to close down those other ones. So really, um, our next bit around is to really work with our partnering agencies. So a lot of our support agencies that are helping our customers either in our tenancies or in private rental or through the homelessness program, um, of providing them a portal so that they can provide the work that they're doing into our, into our solution to support the tenants as well. So that those that, you know, sort of teaching them how to use some of the online as well. We don't, we don't have the resources to do that. We, we have self-serve centers in our, in our newly upgraded modernized, modernized offices, but we don't have that regular contact as, as the support services do. So they're really key for us. Sigh. No. <laughs> I believe that you said you haven't been able to to uh, allow residents to log their jobs. Or you have? No, both, both of us have. That. Yep. You, have. Yeah, you can raise an order but on both of us, sorry. and not a barrier for us because we've put it into the new contracts that are going out. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Ours are out for tender at the moment, yeah. And we will be. Right, okay. So it's about them having the appropriate technology there and with all their teams on the ground to be able to upload the data and continue the same. It, it, it is about the technology, but it's also about the willingness to be performance managed against yes. that. Yes, yes. So if we said, target to say, uh, you know, we're going to put a tracker, you'll say you're going to be out there in four hours, well yes they do get measured on that, but is it public and is a client tracking it, that's a little different, mm. you know, that's, mm. that's, that performance management is sort of, you know, another level, so mm. that's been some of the pushback, but I think, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. Um, General Dunbar. Questions about maintenance, is it around um, contractor performance or around condition of property? Both. Yeah, but I mean, certainly there's, they, the one drives the other um, around uh, making sure that the work is done quality and to make sure that the full work of sc the scope of works has been done. You looked skeptic at me. Lance, do you want to answer a question? Because you didn't necessarily believe my answer, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's also about the stock. performance levels for um, for that maintenance contract. What do you deem as clean, safe and habitable? And our standards and variations of that would differ amongst this whole room uh, as it does with our customer base. So that's really hard to get. And that's why I propose I sort of play a, didn't play a very good poker face. <laughs> Oh, it's absolutely the condition of the original stock. I mean, ours is very old. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the comments around the balance between the, the stock being aging and in poor condition in general, 
um, and then managing the performance. Um, yeah. We, we need to tackle both of them. What we really need to do is be asking our customers more frequently, though, because they're often one of our best reports on at least the immediate work that's been done um, and also what's, what's not yet done. Yeah. Any more questions? OK, can we get a round of applause for Alice, please? <laughs> and uh, if we can get another one for all the presenters, would be great. So guess what? It's over. We're finished. <laughs> so um, on behalf of uh, the National Housing Conference, Ahuri and Civica, uh, thanks for your attendance over the last couple of days. Hopefully you've found the, uh, the sessions out of the think tank really informative and useful. Um, obviously it's time to get frocked up and, and ready to uh, party. Uh, so hopefully we see you all at dinner uh, a little bit later.